Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Previously, we finished the code that handles the transfer of light data to the GPU, using resource buffers. Today, we're going to try and light our scene, using simple forward shading with directional lights. First, we need a function that is called each frame to update the light buffers. For example, light parameters data will be updated with the latest light direction and position. It will also resize the GPU buffers if needed. In addition we need a function that returns the buffer's virtual address for the current frame and another function that returns the number of non-callable lights for a given light set key. Because we're passing a reference to D3D12 frame info, we need to forward declare it using the correct namespace. We'll implement these functions next. First we assert that a light set exists for the key that we pass through the frame info. Right now there's no field in frame info for the light set key, so let's add it first. While I'm here, I'm also going to add two fields for the last frame time and for the average frame time. We need to include d3d12core.h in order to have access to frame info. Using this assertion we make sure that a light set already exists with this key. Next we get a reference to the light set. We return from this function if the set doesn't contain any lights. If there are lights in this set, then we get a reference to a light buffer which can be updated using the current light set. Let me make a copy of light set key so we don't have to type the whole thing every time. This is all for updating the GPU buffers. However, we also need to update the light data in order to be in sync with transform component of each light entity. Therefore we need to add another function to the light set class that updates light data that depend on transform components. For directional lights, we only need to update the light direction. When we implement other light types, we're also going to have to update the light positions. For updating directional lights, we skip any light that is invalid, again because the arrays for non-cullable lights are not tightly packed. Next we get a reference to light parameters for each enabled non-cullable light. We use the light's entity ID to get its orientation and use it to update the light direction parameter. Before updating light buffers, we call this function to update the light data first. Getting GPU virtual address of the current light buffer is quite straightforward. We simply get a reference to the light buffer for the current frame and return its buffer address. Finally, the function that returns the number of non-cullable lights is called for the given light set key. We're now ready to integrate the light module into the low-level renderer. First, we call initialize and shutdown functions as we do for other modules. Then we update light buffers just before doing the geometry render pass. 
The results of this update will be used for light culling and rendering the scene. In addition to light data, we also need to pass the number of directional lights to the shaders. We can pass this information as part of the global shader data which is a constant buffer. After adding a new field to global shader data structure, we can call non-cullable light count function to set its value. We use the light set key that's provided in the frame info. The next step is to use the lighting data in the geometry render pass. Here we need to add a new root parameter for directional lights buffer. This way we can pass the GPU virtual address of the buffer to our pixel shader. The pixel shader will read the light parameters from this buffer. So we add this root parameter as a shader resource view to the root signature, and it will be accessible by the pixel shader through register number 3. In GPass render function, we set this root parameter every time a different root signature is used. I accidentally defined the number of directional lights as a floating point value, but obviously it should be an integer. Now that we're here, we can also change the type of view dimensions to be floating point values. I'm by no means an expert in the graphics hardware coding, but it seems to me that it'd be more efficient not to have integer to float conversions in the shaders. So, now we only have to cast the integers in the C++ side once every frame. I will leave the types in frame info as integers, because comparing integers is much quicker than floats. Alrighty. The application runs without errors. We need to access our light data in the pixel shader. We can define a structured buffer of directional light parameters and map it to register T3, so that it agrees with the root signature we defined earlier. Before writing the pixel shader, I'd like to briefly explain basic diffuse and specular lighting. This is one of the simplest lighting models that, although not physically accurate, produces results that are good enough to fool our brains to think the lighting is correct. Suppose we have a surface, S, with a normal, N. We can have a light ray shining from any direction onto the surface. We can model the diffusion of this light by the surface, simply by stating that the light ray is scattered equally in all directions. The amount of light that's reflected by the surface depends on the direction of light. At grazing angles, the amount of reflected light becomes smaller, Whereas when the light shines from directly above the surface, the amount of reflected light is at its maximum. Note that it doesn't matter from which direction we view the surface. Keeping the light direction constant, we always see the same amount reflected from all directions. Because in this model, light is reflected in all directions equally, if we'd sum the reflected light's energy along all directions, we'd get a value that could be greater than the amount of energy that came in with the original light ray. In other words, the energy output can be greater than the input, which is physically impossible. There are of course more physically correct lighting models, but we'll get to those after we've set up the basics. Light that's reflected off of a surface has an additional component that both depends on light direction and the viewing angle. This is called the specular component of lighting, and as you can see, it has a direction that we'd get by reflecting the light vector along the surface normal. Also note that the amount of light that the camera sees depends on the camera's position with respect to the surface. 
This model is called Fong Lighting which dates back to 1975 when it was published. Let's have a look at how it can be expressed in mathematical equations, so that we can use them to calculate the lighting in our shader programs. Let's consider the angle theta between the incoming light ray and the normal vector of the surface. As we saw earlier, the amount of reflected light is at its maximum when theta approaches zero. When the light ray is parallel to the surface, it's not going to be reflected at all. We can mathematically model this behavior by using the cosine function of theta. As you can see, the value of this function is 1 when theta is 0, and it goes to 0 when theta has a value of negative or positive pi. Remember that the cosine of the angle between two vectors is proportional to the dot product of the two vectors. If we make sure that our vectors are normalized, calculating this cosine is a simple dot product. We must also reverse the direction of the light vector in order for the result to have the correct sign. So the diffuse part of the lighting can be calculated by taking the dot product of the normal value at the pixel position and the negated light direction. For the specular part, we first need to reflect the light vector along the surface normal. Then we can create the same transition from theta equals 0 to theta equals plus or minus pi. This time however, we're going to raise the resulting value to some power. We call this the specular power. The higher this value, the smaller the specular spot will be and the shinier the surface will look. Here we can see what our model looks like using different specular powers. The final color of the pixel is the sum of diffuse and specular lights, multiplied by light color, light intensity, and surface color. Now we're ready to write our pixel shader. In our pixel shader, we get the normal vector at this pixel position. Because this is an interpolated value, it's possible that this vector has a non-unit length. That's why we need to normalize it again. Next we can define a vector from the point on the surface which we're trying to shade, towards the camera. We can calculate this vector simply by subtracting the world position of the surface point from the camera position. We can calculate the contribution of each directional light to the color of this pixel. For the diffuse part of the lighting, we compute the cosine of the angle between surface normal and the vector towards the light. That's why we negated the light direction. The dot product of two normal vectors equals the cosine of the angle between the vectors. We'll only use the values that are greater than zero, which means we only shade the pixels that are facing in the light direction. To compute the specular part of the light, we first need to reflect light's direction vector along the surface normal. The specular term is the cosine of view direction, and this reflected light vector to some power that we can choose freely. The higher this power, the more specular or shiny the material will be rendered. We multiply the intensity of the light with its color in order to get its full dynamic range. Then we multiply this color with the sum of diffuse and specular light values. The resulting value is added to the color of the pixel. At the end, we can also add an ambient term to avoid having totally black pixels. The saturate function will clamp the color value between 0 and 1, before outputting it from the pixel shader. I need to fix a few typos before we can compile this shader. The view direction is a 3D vector and therefore it should be a float 3 type. I spelled normal wrong here. And obviously we need a second parameter for the max function here. We can run the application, however the output doesn't look right. I'm not sure what's causing this, 
but let's try setting the light set key in the frame info along with the average frame time to make it complete. I can try inspecting the light data to see if we're setting everything correctly. The number of lights looks right. Let me see what happens if we don't set the root parameter for the light buffer. Oopsie. That crashed the driver. I'm glad it didn't crash the recording program. Okay, let's put it back. Now I'm checking if I didn't accidentally use the wrong buffer enumeration somewhere, but that doesn't appear to be the case either. Hmm. Oh, I see. We're using an uninitialized color variable which has a random value. We need to set it to zero before accumulating lighting results. Now you see it works fine. Nice. Let me hijack one of our directional lights and make it always point in the same direction as the camera. Remember that one of our lights has a Z value equal to one. We can look for it in our shader and set its direction such that it's the same as the camera direction. Now it's lighting the character from wherever the camera is. Awesome! We're almost ready to make AAA games. In the next video, we're going to expand our scene here and see if we can find any bugs that need fixing. As always thank you for joining me and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub, so you don't have to type everything over from the videos. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then, take care and happy game engineering.